So we're going to be moving on to our shared conversation here. Um, and I think um, a few common themes shine through all your talks. Um, I think the first thing that I, that I very much noticed was the, 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 the concept of space. Um, physical space, of course, in your talk, um, Frauke. So, but also legal space um, and educational space, labor law space, um, and different ways of creating space um, and creating spaces um, through family and family support, um, through the law, um, in terms of dress, travel, um, new educational fields, um, breaking them open. Um, for women and by women, of course, um, but also through even, um, I heard, religious edicts um, as a way of creating space. Um, and, of course, also direct activism um, came up in your talks. Um, but I also heard challenges, and um, mostly challenges in terms of, for example, a need for more role models, um, basic rights uh, even, um, awareness of rights, of course, which is a very important issue. You can't claim your rights if you're not aware of them, obviously. Um, equal pay, which I think rings a bell for many of us here in this room tonight. Um, big issue here as well. Um, yeah, and um, women's success in terms of marriage, and I think for some of us that might ring a bell here as well. <laughs> um, and of course, family challenges, challenges within the family. Um, so I think there is a lot, to, a lot, a lot to talk about, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions in the audience as well. Um, so we will definitely get to that. Um, but to kick off our conversation, I would actually quite like to, um, for starters, to flip the perspective for a minute, if that's okay with you. Um, so my first question would be, in a way, to Frauke, but also in a way to actually to all of you. Um, and I was, I was wondering, um, knowing that you're a historian and um, having lived in both Germany um, and, of course, having been away from Germany for a long time, having experience of sort of both areas, um, there is, of course, a long history of entanglement um, between the West and the Middle East, um, and especially when it comes to what we sort of call the women's issue. Um, so I was, I was wondering about your perspective on um, what is the one thing that we here in the Netherlands um, should learn or should stop doing or should engage in, um, in our thinking perhaps, or speaking, um, acting, um, when it comes to this topic. Um, maybe, Frauke, I can give you one of these mics. I'm sure one of them works. <laughs> This has a green light, so that should do it. And maybe it works, yeah. Well, it is, I think, a very important question that you raise here. And my answer is uh, quite straightforward. Start at home. When the question of um, perception of Western society, of the Gulf countries and the women role, role of women um, is quite often the point of criticism, which is often not qualified, and do educate yourselves to learn a bit more and to engage with more qualified um, comment on um, what's happening in the Middle East when it comes to women. Because I think this evening we really have, have heard from um, all sides that things are changing so fast that looking back on the history in European countries and societies, things have moved steadily on, but in the Gulf, it is, things are, some things are moving with lightning speed. And, um, uh, and therefore, I think if, there want, if one wants to have more um, engagement between Western countries, in this case, of course, Holland, and Gulf countries, um, do throw overboard preconceived ideas about women in the Gulf and listen to the ladies here. Would any one of you want to add something to that? Yeah, I 
Let's see if we can... Oh, oh. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. Too many mics, too much water. <laughs> So I think, I mean, I... Do second your comment, uh, Doctor. I think it's a... Oh, it's probably the water. Okay. <laughs> I, I think um, it's very important that... It's, it's one, yeah. thank you. Um, it's very important for people who are interested in the Middle East, or actually write about the Middle East, because that's, let's start with that. Because I've seen a lot of articles um, uh, that I've read. I thought, like, you know... And it's written by Middle Eastern experts, and it actually shocks me because, and it shocks others because thinking like, probably some of them even haven't been to the Middle East. They haven't uh, traveled to the Middle East, and they write um, in the name of being an expert. And um, it's very disappointing because this is the media, this is projecting uh, these type of, uh, you know, um, information about the Middle East, uh, about Middle Eastern women. Uh, and it's it also actually that, uh, kind of downgrade the, woman, uh, the work that the women are working on. I mean, there's so many activists currently in the Middle East. There's so many role models. And it's a shame to hear uh, often like in articles that, you know, women cannot work, women cannot have to dress to a certain dress code in order to go out. And some of it is actually false information. And it's... Um, Sorry, I sound like Trump, but I'm not. But, uh, but <laughs> it is actually false information. And, um, and um, so what for, uh, for Middle Eastern experts or people who are interested in travel to the region? I mean, people have now the opportunity to travel. We, we live in a, such a global world. It's becoming very easy visa-wise. So travel to the region, take the opportunity to actually understand what's going on. And, and also bring uh, in initiatives more uh, people from the Middle East to, uh, to the West to talk about things. I mean, this initiative is great, but needs to be more. There needs to be more talks. I've attended conferences, and I've seen that a uh, conference on the Middle East, and the majority were Westerners. And they think, OK, I mean, that's very interesting, but you're talking about something that oh, you did study, but it's not that you're living a day-to-day with. So uh, that, that's, for me, is the uh, vital. Yeah, so basically, um, people to people, contact person to person on maybe even an individual basis, um, yes. or like you're saying, by traveling um, or attending like events said, like tonight. Uh, yeah, like you said, having <laughs> um, a relationship. <laughs> for example, that's a very quick way, of course. <laughs> no, but um, just exactly. I mean, just understanding. Take it, it's also sometimes that I've. I've had questions. I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't raise questions, but really some of them are very silly questions. Uh, you know, that we're living in a day that you can, you can Google things up. You can, you know, look <laughs> things up on, on, on social media. There's so many things. Uh, and, you know, we're okay. I, I, I mean, look, look, there are so many women that you've seen from the pictures that are doing great job, uh, that are, are working hard, and they are continue to work hard. So... So please always try to take the time to, to, to research into something and, and uh, come to the Middle East. I mean, I, I, I told the story actually to, um, earlier that when I moved, when I was studying in London, and I, when I moved to Abu Dhabi, I decided to go for a six-month uh, placement at a law firm there. And uh, so I said to my mom, I'm going to Abu Dhabi. And she said, where? And I said, Abu Dhabi. She's like you can't go to Abu Dhabi or I'm married, you know, what are you gonna wear? You don't wear the abaya. Even my mother, who is originally from the Middle East, had this idea of Abu Dhabi because Abu Dhabi wasn't out in the media, it wasn't a place to visit back then, 12 years ago. So, uh, I mean, even a person like my mom I'll blame because she's from the region and she, she didn't, uh, you know, know about this, so. So something else I hear in Araya's talk is, um, or heard actually, is listening to voices from the region such as yourselves um, and creating perhaps here a platform um, for those voices rather than people speaking on behalf of or speaking for. Is that something you would recognize yourself in? 
So I was actually going to pick up on that in a second. I was going to tell you that information is everywhere. At this point, you can just search something online and it will be available. But at the same time, you have to do your due diligence to see what exactly is fact and what isn't fact. So you have to be able to check the credibility of the sources, check with the people, check with local NGOs, check with international NGOs. So it's very important or pertinent for you to be able to connect with the people. On the other side of things, we might think here that women in a specific area, in a specific country, might want specific types of rights, when they might not think that there is a problem at all. The only way for you to be able to know what rights these women want is to be able to speak to them, to be able to speak with the people there and get that information out there. Well, my next question would also be for you, actually, um, and it's about art. So that also leads me um, to take a quick look behind us, because we've been so absorbed in our talks. But meanwhile, Nora has, uh, was working hard for a while, um, and you've made a wonderful setup. So very curious what this is going to turn into when it goes full color. Um, but this looks great already. So curious to see more. Yeah, it's great. No, yeah, it's great. So, um, Fatima, when I was listening to your talk, um, what came to mind for me was um, the artwork of a Saudi artist, uh, Manala Doayam. She uh, created an artwork called the Tree of Guardians, um, together with women from different cities in Saudi Arabia, um, because the, the, the drawn tree of, of the genealogical tree um, only goes through the male line. The women don't show up in the tree. Um, so what she did was gathering groups of women um, to create matrilineal genealogical trees, um, tracing back their lineage on the maternal side of the family. Um, and of course, the Saudi context is very different, and there is the male guardianship system over women, of course. Um, so I do realize that the context is, is really quite different to Kuwait. Um, but nevertheless, in a more general sense, I thought this was a very original way of visualizing um, such an important issue. Um, of course, Saudi Arabia also has the citizenship issue that you discussed. Um, so I was wondering from that respect whether, um, whether this speaks to you, um, and whether you believe that art is maybe a fruitful way of discussing this issue or perhaps also other issues that we've heard about tonight, um, of visualizing these issues or creating social change. Um, we're seeing, of course, Nora's work here materialize, materializing. Um, so I was wondering um, whether you could comment on that, whether that speaks to you at all. Of Maybe course. not. But. No, no, okay. So <laughs> while you were sitting there describing it to me, I felt moved by it. And that's the purpose of art. You just described me a piece of art and how th thought provoking it might be. And I could just paint a picture. And that's the purpose of why we have art, whether it's through photography, whether it's through a painting, whether it's through poetry. The reason people like to be moved by art is it makes people, or it calls people to action. So it calls people to go out and do things and advocate on behalf of rights. We've seen this through paintings or through act arts during times of war. We've seen this through art and the beginning of women's rights with the lady and the arm. You all know exactly what painting I'm describing when I talk about this because these are pieces of art that became famous over time because they called people to action. They made them move. And so I love this piece of art. When we talk about tracing the lines through the females rather than the males, it shows exactly what is what we are being deprived of as women when we trace our lines through a patriarchal or bloodlines of the father. So I love it. Well, thank you. That's, that's very special actually to hear that from a very different context that this piece of work still um, sounds through also in, in, in the things that you're um, working on and that you were talking about. So, um, Hint, um, you mentioned how people took to social media. Um, towards the end of your talk, we saw some tweets up on the uh, screen there um, to express themselves. And um, of course, there's already been a lot of talk about social media um, in different contexts, Arab Spring, etc. So I don't want to go there. Um, but um, I would like to hear, um, if possible, a bit more about the role of social media um, in women's lives. Is it having an effect um, different, perhaps, than to men's lives? Um, is, is that an issue at all, or maybe not? 
Um, and a question that I get asked very often, well, not so much anymore, but a few years ago at the height of the Me Too movement, um, there were a lot of questions about um, Me Too in the Gulf and in the broader region as well. So could you maybe comment on that in the role of social media? Um, I, actually, I actually kept myself from answering the first question because that question is kind of related to what I have to say now. So um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, inquiring more about the Gulf and the people and the women, um, when I got into Middle Eastern studies doing my master, I did notice that people just love talking about women in the Gulf. Um, and that's because they consider them very exotic. Like, oh, these women living in like high walls, covered, having so much money, luxury, etc., cetera, um, slowly making their way into the public. Um, yeah, and you know, to a certain extent, it's demeaning. It's very like Oriental, etc. But at the same time, I think we should go way past that because social media. I think social media has really empowered a lot of women to just be out there. Um, it gave them a voice when it comes to how they really feel about their status, their, their situation, their rights. I mean, when I talk about Qatari women, it's very hard for me to define what is a Qatari woman or who are Qatari women because. Nowadays, it's not like before, where it was e where it was easier for people to define a certain group. Now, within within the group of women, you have women who have different inclinations, um, different views on, you know, society, politics, world politics, whatever is happening. So, for example, if you go on Twitter and you type the, hash, uh, the hashtag Qatari women's rights or al Mara al Qatariya, you would notice that there is a, an, an area of, of, of views where some women want to see radical change happening today, happening tomorrow, and some women don't want to see change at all. You know, They're just happy with the situation in the country. I mean, believe it or not, um, through social media, you can even see that women are just happy to be at home, are just happy to not work, you know, and just have their husbands or their fa fathers pr to provide for them. So I feel like while there is so much talk on, um, you know, women's progress and participation, etc., let's not also forget that there are women who just don't want to partake in that. Um, so it's it's definitely important to shed light on old perspectives, and not only um, in terms of women who are you know out there and, and fighting and all that. Although that's also very important because. I, for example, have gone a long way. I've been, um, I've been away from home for about seven years. Um, the first time I wanted to travel abroad, I really had to go head to head with my mom. Um, and that was back in 2012 when um, I had an opportunity to go to NYU for a semester abroad. And my mom had so much concern because what she knows about the US is what she sees on TV. Uh, fraternity parties, booze, drugs, etc. So. In her mind, how can I let my daughter, and, and keep in mind, my mom grew up in an environment where it was, um, Qatar back then was drastically different. I mean, it was very secluded. Um, it was very focused on like family upbringing. It was very focused on women going to, let's say, high schools and then universities and then getting married. And that's what life was really about. But nowadays, women from that generation are just shocked by the changes um, that are happening because they never thought that Qatar today would look like um, what it does now. So again, back to the social media uh, aspect, um, I think it's, it's equally um, important for academics and non-academics to go on social media and explore voices because there are plenty, there's plenty to see. Um, and in terms of the Me Too movement, in the Gulf, unfortunately, um, spaces are very limited when it comes to voicing, um, you know, incidences on sexual harassment and, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate uh, situations like that. And that's also, that, that also goes back to the idea of, of honor, the concept of honor and the fact that women are burdened with, with uh, the idea of like honor even more than men. Um, throughout time, and this is one of the things that have persisted um, since the beginning of nation states, since early on in the region, until this very day, where women are the embodiment of culture and the embodiment of honor of um, of, uh, of their families. So a lot of the times, when something happened to a woman, she's blamed. And of course, we see that in the West as well, where um, in the Me Too movement, women have said that we were afraid to actually come out because. We would be we would be blamed, um, but then of course with the with the whole movement and the female support, women were less afraid to actually be blamed. Um, so I hope that you know in the future, um, women in the region would feel the same way about these situations and you know find um, let's say uh, you know 
so, like find the solidarity in order for them to overcome their fears when it comes to these, these issues um, and also to hopefully fix them for future gener generations. So, yeah. um, so Raya, I want to give you another chance to speak as well, of course. Um, um, what, what triggered um, your, your talk triggered in me um, sort of a link to the Dutch situation. Um, and I was very curious about your perspective. Um, we see women moving into prominent positions in the Gulf, of course, um, but we also see um, a low, in many countries, low labor participation still of women. Um, and I was wondering, also recently we've had a big discussion in the Netherlands about quota, yet again and whether or not quotas should be um, instilled for women um, in, in top positions mostly. And um, I was wondering, is that an issue um, from where you're standing? Um, is that a discussion at all? Um, can we learn from your side? Um, is it, is it, does it and, and also, um, also from your perspective, of course, being Dutch Iraqi, as you also mentioned yourself, um, how do you look at the discussion here in the Netherlands coming from your perspective? Uh, in terms of quota, like yes. uh, quota in, in business is, is or that, political yeah, participation? In, in business, yes, in the yes. labor market. I think, I mean, uh, just also having worked with international companies, uh, I have seen the, the movement of quota. And I have seen the, um, the, the, the quality of, uh, I'm not always with quota, but I think it's a good step to start with, uh, to see actually faces of women on board. That's very important. Now, this initiative has been recently in the UAE. We haven't seen uh, an each board a woman yet, because there are not uh, yet, uh, and, and even that's in Holland the case, I don't think there are fines for companies, uh, being, uh, will they be fined for? I, that, I don't think so. Yeah. I think no. Yeah, some countries they want to actually introduce a fine for companies uh, that are not abiding by the um, uh, by the uh, resolutions issued to place uh, women on board. Um, and uh, but uh, I mean, I think it's a good step because we need to see more faces, like how women entered into politics through some countries through quota. Uh, but we need to see quality uh, women, because the problem is that's global. This is not only a Middle Eastern issue. That I face that, for example, in, in an in a, uh, um, international firm where we had only one female partner on board. And uh, yes, and, uh, and that's... Uh, she actually did not work towards women initiatives program inside the firm. Uh, I think she, uh, uh, in our opinion, like with my colleagues, I think she worked more towards uh, trying to please her male colleagues. Um, and because, I mean, it, it was like a, a, a board of like 10 men and then she's the only woman. So it's quite hard to be actually outspoken uh, you have to, you know, have the courage and confidence. And there's also a lot of politics in organization like that. So if you are going to start to, 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 to uh, basically uh, bring things up, oh, yes, we need to do this for women, we need to do that for women, you could be sidelined in these type of organization. And this is a global issue that women are facing. This is not a Middle Eastern issue. This is not, we have seen this out throughout, uh, you know, uh, even in uh, international conferences, we had discussed this issue that this is still a problem. And, and maybe we can have examples from the audience, someone who works in a company, whether in a, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if there's any board member that will be <laughs> to discuss, but, but just, uh, just to have also perspectives uh, from people working here. I, I heard you mention uh, male colleagues, um, so that makes me wonder, um, we're talking about the position of women, women's issues, and we've got an all-female panel, um, but it does make me wonder, what about the men? I, yeah, can I just mention something? Do you, uh, it's a question for all of you, actually. Um, what, about, what about the men? Yeah, can I, uh, men play a, a quite big role in the, in, in the Middle East. So, um, and 
I think this is my opinion. We've always had, even when, uh, when uh, y you know, I started working with a woman organization, we always try, and Frank, you will know this, we always try to bring men into our uh, events. We always, we, we never held like, uh, that's, my, uh, that's my view, we shouldn't exclude men. We have to have men into our discussions, and I'm very happy to see actually men attending because they are part of the society. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we, it's, it's a society. We can't just say, oh, let's exclude men. Let's discuss women issues. How would men know about our issues if they are not aware of? And, and you, we have seen like many books, like and, um, I've mentioned this example of Lean In, um, uh, Charlie Sandberg, where she mentioned that men did not know about her issues. For example, when she requested a parking uh, spot to replace it for, with the CEO, she said, I'm heavily pregnant and I'm part, not part of the management and I want to actually, I find it unfair that the management have, um, I have a parking spots, and I don't, and I'm having a problem, and I have to walk so far to find a parking. He didn't know about the issues, because he was never part of these discussions, and she had the courage to go and, and, and discuss it with her CEO. She succeeded, and she got parking spots uh, for pregnant women. So these are very important things that men have to be part of this. And, and uh, uh, in the UAE, men are, part of uh, a lot of uh, the women organizations. I mean, it's, that's, some of them do want to, edit, some, some not, but I mean, they are part of it. Do you have something to add to that? I can see you nod. Uh, so uh, back home in Qatar, we have an issue uh, which the previous president of the National University uh, labeled as the missing boys. Um, so a lot of the times what happens is that um, Qatari boys would, or Qatari men would graduate high school and then the first thing that comes to mind, oh, like I'll just get a job in the public sector um, or, or I'll join the military and without even giving the thought of going to college or pursuing university education and stuff and that's because the government pays very generously in the public sector. Um, so they're very comfortable basically thinking that they can get away without, um, get away with their, with their long-term career plans without even um, having a, a university degree. So that's something that definitely has to be addressed. Another issue that I, that, um, that I find is that in the quota system itself, um, yes, they're trying to give women certain seats and certain jobs um, in, in different fields, but at the same time, you just don't wanna fill up the quotas just because they're females. You wanna fill up um, the, the quotas because they're qualified females. And I feel like sometimes that's unjust for certain men who are actually even qualified to, the, to do the job. Um, but again, I mean, this is something that the, the, the government is really trying to address. Um, hopefully, you know, in the, in the coming years, they will encourage um, these boys to, you know, pursue university degrees, especially that there is a huge investment in education. Um, so hope to see that. Yeah. Um, so my personal view on this is you definitely cannot exclude the men because men make up half of the population as well, but what you need is to be able to educate and raise awareness, and you cannot start to effectuate change without also including the men. But that means if we're going to say that we have 50 seats for members of parliament, there needs to be a 25-25, not a 10 women and 40 males on the, our members of parliament. It needs to be pretty equal. And for us to be able to achieve such equality, we need the men on board as well. So it's male allies as well, or maybe, Frau, do you have a... Just maybe one, one extra comment. I agree with all of what you say, but um, uh, again, what, uh, I mean, men need help as well. And particularly, <laughs> please elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> young, uh, you have you have partly touched on this. The young men in that society, I think, need really do do need help because they are from their background and from their families and from society. They are not encouraged in the same way as women. Go out and do what we help you to do, and we are happy you achieve. Um, young men are not told that. It's actually tolerated that they under, you know, that they stay at home, or what is the other thing, of course, that they go to the military and, um, 
and, and have a career which ultimately is not necessarily um, a, a challenge that uh, intellectually. And um, uh, these young men need much, much more encouragement to trust themselves, to see that they can do and that they should not um, depend on society to carry them along. Um, they should see that they are given the same genes and the same facilities to um, and make use for what is there, the fantastic universities, the uh, brilliant encouragement by organizations that um, uh, start up to help startups. Most of the startups are actually done by women. Female uh, entrepreneurship, of course, is a very female encouragement. Yeah. yeah, there are some fantastic startups by done by uh, teams of young men, but there are, I think, the exception, and uh, they do need help. <laughs> so, one last question before we move on to the audience, because I'm sure there is a lot that um, you would like to ask um, these wonderful ladies. Um, it was the question that was um, with, I held about 150 interviews in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, and this was the favorite question of literally every single woman that I spoke with, um, and it's about the future. Um, and the question is, if I know, Raya, that you have children, um, you told me you have children at home, um, I'm not sure about the three of you. Um, so either, if you have a daughter or a son, or maybe if you want to have children in the future, your future daughter or son, um, what is your dream for them in their home country? Maybe very briefly from each of you, um, a comment on that. Um, okay, so first of all, I don't have any children yet, but I always think about this question because I always wonder what kind of environment I would like my future children to grow up in. And I definitely would want them to be able to make their own decisions. I want them to be able to feel as if they are independent and that they are to be trusted in this society and then they can grow up without any discrimination. And for that to happen, we need to start building the blocks for that sort of societies from now on to be able to do that in the future. A, a brief, um, I, I do have children and I do have five grandchildren and three of them, <laughs> three of them live in, in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi. And um, I digress a little. My fear is, um, will they be able to withstand the temptation to take drugs? It's a worry everywhere, not only in that. But I, I, I do bring this up because it is a worry also in the Gulf countries, and I think one should mention it. Do you see it as well, a... That I don't know, but uh, I mean, there, there are things outside which certainly are not good for anyone, and certainly not for young people. So you see that as one of the challenges? Um, I that see that has. as a challenge, yeah. yes. I see that my, my grandchildren are... The, the el eldest is six years old. It's not... Um, but it is a worry for the future, and I think it is a, a worry for that society, just like all societies. And um, I just wanted to bring this up as a, as a topic. Yeah. Thank you. Raya, you have children? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so. not to the drugs level yet, hopefully. <laughs> But actually, it is a concern now in in the in the Middle East, in the wide Middle East, um, the drugs issue. Um, but my concern is actually where where will be, well, will they live actually in the future? Because um, I mean, they still they're not from the UAE. They have different nationalities. They they all over the place. So. I'm just, I hope they're not gonna grow up with the identity crisis. Um, uh, so that's one of the issue. The, the, the other issue is actually, if we will remain to live in the Middle East as a family, I hope to see a better Middle East because I myself, I don't like to see the Middle East we are in today. It's not only about the GCC, but it's the whole wider region. Um, you know, there needs to be less discrimination. Um, there needs to be um, uh, better rights giving to citizens. 
and there needs to be job creation. We have a major problem in creating jobs uh, in the Middle East. So I don't even know whether they're going to have a job, uh, you know, if they're going to live there. So that's, that's, that's the worry. And then the last worry is the drugs. I, it's the <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't have kids as well, um, but I do have two sisters. I'm the eldest. And uh, my, uh, my sister is, uh, there's a seven year difference between me and my sister. And then the third one, there's a 14 year difference. So sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm the mother. And um, my Sara, my sister, who's uh, 21 years old, she recently graduated um, from Northwestern University in Education City, and she did journalism. So now she's working on her applications to um, apply for master programs in the US and in the UK, which I'm very happy about, um, because given that um, I have gone through so much to be at the place I am in today, um, I will make sure that um, they will not go through certain hurdles that I've been through, because now I understand how to overcome them. And I can see that the value of education is, is, is really high because no one can silence you. No one can ever tell you that you can do this because you're a woman, especially back home. Um, and, and, I, and I do see a value in men having fear in women who are you know, highly educated, and we do have that mentality back home. But I always remind my sisters, um, especially Sara, because you know, she's embarking her, her, on her educational career, which is that, that that doesn't matter because no matter what that will come later on and what matters is is the path onwards um, and even my younger sister the youngest one she's um, she's only 14 but she's already saying I want to pursue law which is I mean for me it's it's awesome because 14 years old she wants to pursue law but it's also because she sees that her as a female is very empowering. She wants to use that in the future in order to to better the future but this is amazing because when I was 13 years old, I mean, I wasn't really open to issues on women and, and stuff like that. Like, I've had my, my observations and such, but not as much as her. And I think, um, and I think that, you know, I will, I will try my best to make sure that no one silences them and no one stops in their way for when it comes to their, their future, so. Thank you very much. That's on that note. Um, we'll have to close off this conversation, unfortunately. Um, but fortunately, we've got many more questions coming up for sure. Um, uh, there's um, a little bit of a procedure for the question and answer session. Uh, first of all, we have Lotta who will um, try to make her way around the room with a microphone, uh, which could be a little bit challenging, I think, considering it's a little bit packed. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, and if you can stand, if you could, please, that would be great, because it's very hard for us to actually see you from we can we can see not we cannot see all of you very well. So, um, if you could stand up, that would be great. Um, and if you could tell us your affiliation, that would be very helpful as well. Um, and of course, who you're addressing the question to, so um, they know that they're the ones to answer the question. Um, we absolutely love short questions, so um, please, no statements, no um, reflections, no storytelling. Um, there will be plenty of space and time for that during um, the drinks afterwards, um, and we will be there as well. So um, if you have those types of remarks, then please save those for um, the drinks um, in the foyer. So for now, just short, um, short questions, that would be great. All right, so if you could raise your hands, please, and then Lotta will find her way to you. Hi, uh, my <laughs> name is uh, Gertrude Hoetjes. I'm a PhD ca candidate at the University of Exeter. And my question is to Fateme. And I was wondering, what, are, what is, according to your opinion, the main obstacle to the reform of the nationality law in Kuwait? Okay, so the biggest um, obstacles as of right now come in the form of cultural values as well as family values as well. And the thing is, when you're trying to change a cultural value, you could change it, you could legislate it, but if the family is not convinced, they will be your biggest obstacle for perceiving any positive change. And so for you to be able to do anything, the first thing you have to start out with is for the family. They have to be convinced. And then you move on down to the culture and then you move on to have actual legislation. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anna, I am a founder of Street Art Museum Amsterdam. I wanna go back to drugs. Um, I, 
I live in Amsterdam in a Muslim neighborhood, that's why we have a museum, and I could never imagine alcohol and drugs associated with Middle East. So for me, it's very interesting and new to hear you fear drugs. That, sorry, that's the question. What, what, what is your, the problem? Because I can't imagine it's there. <laughs> Sorry, could you expand yeah. on that, please? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I brought it up as uh, maybe it's, it's um, but it is it exists, and it is it exists because there's money, okay. and where there's money, there are people who exploit the fact that there are uh, young people who can be made to part with their money and eventually been brought in. I would not want to say that it is a very um, prominent problem, but it certainly is. And, and you, you have to only think of the geographical neighborhood. Where is Afghanistan? Okay, okay. And what is the role of, of Iran? It's very close. And, and Iranian actually have done in the 80s and 90s a tremendous job in um, keeping keeping drugs out of the Gulf region, but things, politics have changed, and it is certainly a problem. And um, when I mentioned this as, as my fear uh, for, you know, little, that is actually that the world over, there are problems, and it just uh, is, is, I don't think that my grandchildren will actually continue to live in, in, in the Gulf region. So it is a general fear that one has of, um, yeah, will they have a job? Will their education qualify them to a job and a life that we have had it? Or will they not have a job and then drift into situations that we know we see too much of it on television? And, and it, is, um, it is a topic that one should not, not touch on. Thank you, Frauke. Is there anyone who wants to comment on that? Yes, or do you, you want to move on to the next? Can I just comment on the yeah. drugs issue? Um, I think there's also lack of education in terms of uh, drugs use in the region because it's a taboo subject. So many mothers, uh, I mean, I know how drugs look like because I grew up here. So, but that <laughs> my, like many, many mothers wouldn't know how it looks like. So prob uh, for example, if they will see some, their, you know, their children could be saying anything and they wouldn't know. So there needs to be more education, but actually in the UAE they have done our campaigns. They opened rehab uh, for uh, drugs use and I'm not sure whether they've done the same thing in other GCC country, but they, they, they are becoming more open about the subject. It's, it's no longer a taboo. Uh, I've actually had a, uh, a friend of mine, her brother is an ex-addict and he's, uh, he was in the rehab. Um, and uh, so, so it, it, does, it, it is existing, but, but the government are doing good initiatives. They are discussing also at school. They are also showing some pictures. And there's been recently a um, campaign going on against uh, uh, pills that have a smiley face. And they could, they have strawberry flavors or anything. So they were disputing uh, amongst like 15 years old, 16, that you can actually buy it as a candy. So if, you know, no parents will even spot this at their, you know, children's school bag that this is actually drugs because it could look like a candy. So, but there, there has been some good initiatives, I think. I've seen also like campaigns on the street like about drugs, mental health, and you know, it's, it's becoming more open. I think that's, that's what it is. But still concern, even alcohol is a concern. One should mention that some, in some ways, drugs come into people's uh, lives as um, muscle enhancing. I mean, through people who are very sporty and want to be more yes. better at sport. And that has been a problem. So thank you, yes. It thank you. I saw a hand up there, yes. I hear a lot about uh, the uh, opportunities of jobs and not uh, getting jobs, but what I do wonder is I'm actually a nurse, and uh, I think last year or the year before, uh, there was a, a promotion about getting nurses from other countries to the Middle East and getting a, f uh, getting a, a, a salary of like 5,000 euro a month. So I'm like, how can you uh, get 
people from other countries to work at your country, but don't have the same opportunities for your own people. So that's the thing I'm wondering about. And for who is the question? Uh, who was talking about <laughs> work? <laughs> I think you were talking about work and you were talking about work. So if both of you can, could comment to that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, very briefly then, um, uh, there is work and there's work and not everybody is ready to do some work and nursing is certainly there are schools for nurses in the UAE for and 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 um, local women do train to become nurses but not enough not not in any shape or form enough and this society and uh, depends on on uh, um, nurses to come from abroad just like here and yeah. like anywhere in Europe do you want to? Yeah, because there is an uh, increase of population. I mean, each uh, Emirati family, let's say local uh, UAE family, has, uh, you know, increased in number. So the healthcare is actually very problematic in the UAE in terms of, you know, not having sufficient doctors or clinics. And so people, some people uh, have to go abroad to take that. But now, uh, they have uh, nursing schools. I haven't seen um, local nurses from the country, mainly they're expats. I, I did see increase of Emirati uh, doctors, which was quite refreshing to see a local doctor. Um, but it's, um, I think the, 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 the nursing school is also not a very popular profession. We still uh, live in that uh, part of the Middle East where they want to have, I mean, excuse me, don't think it's not a prestigious. Yes, it's, it, yes, so there is this prestigious, okay, my daughter is going to study, then do a good study, do study uh, to become a doctor or, you know, engineer or lawyer. The, these type of jobs, that's, that's what they're pushing for, and for governments sector, because the government has the best salary and, you know, uh, paid leave and all of that. So uh, so you have a lot of these type of profession that are still considered a bit mm, tricky so that you don't know whether they uh, that uh, you know that, that they're going to actually study this. Uh, and that's why they still need to bring expat to serve the population because population is increasing. So we still need nurses please come and <laughs> It's a good call to action. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, right here in the front. I have a question for all the ladies. You s were saying that uh, foreigners are often ill-informed. How do you f uh, view foreign interference in w women's rights in the Middle East? Do you think the foreigners should be involved in this issue, or do you think, well, let's do the, l let's us take on the job? Okay, so basically, I think that if we want to learn from other people, there's no reason why we don't need, we can't learn from other people. But I think as long as you have locals on the campaigns with you, as long as you have locals who know the law or who know whatever sect that you are working in or sector that you're working in. And I can just give you an example that just springs to mind when you talk about influence from outside. So basically, with the United Nations, when we had the war with Kosovo, the UN sent mostly Western lawyers to deal with the issue in Kosovo, but Kosovo was a civil law jurisdiction, not a common law jurisdiction. So you had all these lawyers from America, you had all these lawyers from UK, you had all these lawyers coming in and dealing with evidence, dealing with the law through how they know how to do it in the West, but that just did not work in Kosovo because Kosovo was a civil law country and if they had just spoken to the Kosovo people, they would have realized this if they had ha had Kosovo lawyers with them because all that evidence became inadmissible and since then the UN now has guidelines on understanding different legal systems of the world. So similarly here in this case, I don't see an issue with learning from the West as long as you understand that also local NGOs should be involved as well instead of it just being international NGOs, international players. Because there are key actors, people who want to work, people who want to do this within the society, and they should be given a chance to do it as well. Yeah. Does anyone want to add to that? 
because it was a question meant for all, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there is this issue um, that is happening in the GCC when it comes to um, asking uh, consulted companies to come and do work. Um, and having these companies, you know, come from abroad, um, mostly uh, Western, uh, European or American, um, coming in not really knowing much about the society. So um, they were not going to do any like um, uh, preliminary work in terms of understanding how the society functions and like in, in terms of like what are the gaps, what are the inequalities, uh, what are the actual issues. And it's also the government's fault to some extent because they shouldn't really rely on these consultancies to just, you know, do, do their job or do the studies and by the same time not having awareness because the governments do know that they don't have full awareness. I mean, even for me as a scholar of education, sometimes when I look into the society, the background, the current situation, I'm just like really perplexed because it's such a puzzle. I mean, it's, this, is, this is a society, this is a culture that is very hard to understand but given the forces in which it has, um, it has evolved. So um, just imagine how just foreigners or foreign intervention could could even deal with a society like that. So I think there has to be effort in order to, to understand before even um, intervening to change certain things, so. And Raya? Okay, actually, you, uh, most of uh, the ladies have already covered uh, what I wanted to say. I think, uh, I mean, I'm quite international when it comes to uh, intervention. I think we, we do need intervention from a global intervention. Uh, but it's not only in the Middle East. I think we need to sort of always like an international forum to discussing, to learn from each other. But it shouldn't be like a pushy intervention. Like uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, earlier about the, the articles that we mentioned that we need to push women to drive in Saudi. And, you know, some of them don't know the full background about the woman issue, uh, women uh, driving in Saudi. So, uh, so I am... Uh, with uh, uh, with foreign intervention, it depends on what type of intervention it is, and it depends who it's coming from. Because uh, uh, I think you've mentioned hint. I mean, there's been some frustration actually with the with the with the consultant companies. Uh, I mean, without naming names, but uh, also in the UAE, that many people were concerned that they are w writing the women empowerment section for uh, the UAE vision or the Saudi vision uh, that's recently published. And uh, some of them have just arrived in the Middle East. So if you're talking about a person like has this been to the Middle East, I mean, like Dr. Anna Marie, I mean, you're an expert, you've lived there, you've actually, you know, you're writing about, it, you've interviewed people. People like Anna Marie are qualified to intervene. I, I mean, it's uh, so, so, and there are many others who are, who have the interest and the passion in changing things. And, and specifically the ones who've already worked on changes in, in other countries. So I think if it's positive intervention, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with it, yes. Any other questions? This is um, your last chance perhaps, or one of your last chances. So raise your hands if you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you allow me, uh, as a person from the Gulf, I am from Qatar, in fact, the father of Hind. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank you, of course, for this really very nice uh, event. Uh, I note a lot of comments I have, but uh, because of limited time, I will just say two things. Uh, the particularity of Gulf states that the local people, the minority in their own countries, within the 40, 50 last years, uh, and a matter of the population got uh, big changes. And unfortunately, this uh, different communities uh, remained together. I mean, there is no really, let's say, interactions between these communities, what either local people or uh, foreign people. This is one point. The second point, uh, I like, of course, the event, but if we want really to make the change, I would like to assure you that even the men, they don't have a lot, I mean, big role to do in Gulf society, actually. The real, real uh, need we need is the political reforms, because in our countries, the power is only in the hand of very few, few people who, who do control everything, whether the sort of men, of sort of women, whatever you can name it. This is what I wanted to, to say. It's not only women, 
Even us women, we need development. We don't have democracy, unfortunately. Because maybe Kuwait is much better, of course, compared with other Gulf countries. But this is really major issue. If you want really to make changes in our countries, it's political reforms. Despite this vision, everybody has 2030 division. But in the, this visions, there is no political reforms. We talk so about economy, we talk about society, we talk about communities, but no politics. So would you, f would you um, want to pose that as a question as well to um, yeah. one or two of the ladies? <laughs> so what's, what's the specific question that, um, that you would like to have an answer to? What I said is my point is very clear. If we want real development of our, in our countries, it is political. It's not Do you wish to comment on that? So what I want to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the reason why I keep emphasizing, and so did the, my colleagues here, um, that change should happen within the family because it's very hard to go up to, go to the government and be like, you know, I should change this today because I think X, Y, and Z. Um, in Qatar, we don't have uh, political transparency as much as Kuwait, for example. Um, women in Kuwait are very impressive. If you look into their history, um, they've been active since the